Hello and welcome back to Solomon's Cave. In the last philosophy video, we looked at one of the giants in ancient Greek philosophy, namely Parmenides, and how he thought the world worked. He believed that, since all being is, change, motion and even time were impossible concepts. Many agreed with him, many others were not so sure, and a few smart people disagreed and started forming counter-arguments. But for now we will look at Parmenides' most loyal defender, Zeno of Elea. Zeno was a bit younger than Parmenides, and he was most likely born in or around 495 BC, and is believed to have died somewhere around 430 BC. Zeno was also from Elea, like Parmenides. Now Zeno was not a poet, so he decided to do philosophy in a different way. He used paradoxes, riddles or thought experiments, to communicate his philosophy. Let's look at the first one. A runner tries to run from point A to point B. So he starts running and running, and then he reaches the halfway point between points A and B. So far so good. I mean, you always have to reach the halfway point before you reach your final destination. Speaking of halfway points, since there is a halfway point between points A and B, there must also be a halfway point between the halfway point and point B, right? Since before the runner reaches point B, he must first reach this second halfway point as well. And between this second halfway point and point B, there is a third halfway point that must be reached first. And then a fourth halfway point, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh. Wait, how many halfway points are there actually? Well, let me tell you, infinitely many. But if you have to reach infinitely many halfway points before you reach point B, is it even possible to reach point B in a limited amount of time? Well, let's look at the other side of the equation. If there is a halfway point between the first halfway point and point B, there must also be a halfway point between the first halfway point and point A and a second between that one and point A, and a third and a fourth, ultimately leading to the runner not being able to move at all. He is stuck in his place and cannot move, since there is an infinite amount of space to cover before his first movement is even visible. Why is that the case? Ultimately, because distance can be infinitely divided, and is therefore infinite in nature. An infinite distance cannot be crossed by a finite being. But our problems don't stop there. Because not only is distance infinitely divisible and thus impossible to cross, time is also infinitely divisible and impossible to cross. To prove that point, he goes back to running again. But instead of having just one person run, there are now two. The one is Achilles. And the other man is... Well, later sources say the other runner may actually be a tortoise. But they do not start from the same spot, because that would not be fair. So instead, Achilles gives the tortoise a head start. So let's put him here. And Achilles runs and runs, and after a short amount of time, he caught up to where the tortoise was. But the tortoise wasn't standing still during that time, so the tortoise is a little further ahead. So let's move the clock forward to the point where Achilles reaches the point where the tortoise is now. There we are, there he is, but there the tortoise is no longer. Again we move the clock forward to the moment where Achilles is at the tortoise's newest place. And again, by the time Achilles arrives, the tortoise has moved on. And again, and again, and again. No matter how many times we make Achilles catch up to the tortoise, the tortoise is always ahead. There is an infinite amount of time units between the start of the race and Achilles catching up, and it is impossible for a finite being to run for an infinite amount of time units. Now you might think that you have a solution for one or maybe both of these riddles, and maybe you do. One of the ways in which you could argue against these is to combine them. Because if one says that motion is impossible because space is infinite and time is finite, 
And the other one says that motion is impossible because space is finite, but time is infinite. Then maybe they can cancel each other out? Not so fast, says Zeno. For you still haven't answered the question, what motion really is. And that's where the problem really lies. These two riddles were just to get you thinking. Imagine an arrow. It is moving from one place to another. Now pause it. If motion takes place in space, in which space is the arrow moving at this very moment? Here's the thing. It is not moving in the space where it is, since at this very moment it is standing still. Nor is it moving where it isn't, because it isn't even there. So it is not moving, since it moves neither here nor there. It moves nowhere, and thus it is not moving at all. Maybe you've come up with a solution for that too. Maybe you think that Zeno is wrong all along. Maybe you think that space is not infinitely divisible, but that there is a shortest possible distance and a shortest possible time. That reality, in a way, is pixelated. Or that movement is ultimately jumpy. And that motion isn't a thing that you can touch or weigh, but you can use it to imprecisely describe the jumping around of things in space. But then, if reality is jumpy, what about this? Imagine three groups of three runners, all an equal distance apart on parallel lines. Group 1 is standing still, group 2 is running to the left, and group 3 is running to the right, at the same speed as the second group. Okay, now let's jump ahead a few moments. Okay, now focus on the middle group, the group running to the left. They moved, or jumped, past one person from the first group, but they jumped past two people from the third group. So they jumped different distances at the same time. How is that possible? Huh? Huh? This is often seen as one of his weakest riddles, and Aristotle, the source for this riddle, quickly dismisses it. But now let's imagine that they aren't runners on the track, but that they are spaceships in some distant corner of the galaxy. And let's add that they are too far away from any particular star or planet to measure their speed. Then, when you put yourself in the middle line of spaceships, and you see other spaceships passing you, the ones to your left twice as fast as the ones to your right, how would you know how fast you were going, or if you were moving at all? You see, movement only makes sense if you have some unmoving object to anchor yourself to in some way. For the runners, that would obviously be the racetrack itself. But without a racetrack, how would you even know what motion is? And if it is jumpy, what is the grid of pixels anchored on anyway? In any case, he has more riddles for us. Not about motion directly, but about an aspect of motion, namely place. Because before there is motion, there has to be something that moves, and that thing has to be in a particular place to start from. So if this thing is in a place, what is the place it is in? Is that place something or nothing? If it is nothing, then how can the thing be in it? If that place is something, then that something has to be in a place too, right? And then that new place also has to be something as well, which implies that it is in a place again. And that place has to be in another place, until you have infinitely many places. That's kind of like asking, where is the universe? Or where did the Big Bang happen? Questions that can, in one sense, only be answered by, surrounded by nothing, which is the equivalent of nowhere. But if the universe is nowhere, how can a universe exist? Ah, think about that for a second. Alright, there is one more category of riddle I want to discuss with you, and that is his paradoxes of plurality. The question here is, is there just one thing, or are there many things? For example, there are different things, 
like people and mountains and grains of sand. Zeno wants to argue for the former by proving that the other one is impossible. So he assumes that there are many things. But if there are many things, there is still a limited number of them. So now we take two of those things. Okay, so how are these two things different? There must be something between them to keep them separate. Because if there is nothing between those two things, they would be stuck together and be one object. But now there are two. So there must be a third thing in between those two objects to keep them separate. But then what is between one of those things and the third thing that we just identified. Again, it can't be nothing, so it has to be something again, and so on and so forth. And so, if you keep going with this logic, there are infinitely many things, even though we just decided that there is a limited number of things. That means that there is both a finite and an infinite number of things at the same time, and that is an impossible contradiction. Therefore, there can only be one thing. Another way in which Zeno tried to argue this is by arguing that if there are many things, there is such a thing as a plurality. A plurality is a group of things that belong together. His arguing goes that, regarding any plurality, that plurality has to be both infinitely small and infinitely large at the same time. Therefore, pluralities cannot exist. The part of a plurality being infinitely small looks something like this. A plurality must consist of parts. If those parts are pluralities as well, then you have to keep on dividing until you reach something that is not a plurality. So all pluralities are composed of things that are not pluralities. And anything that is not a plurality itself cannot have any size. Because if it were to have any size, then it could be divided up and hence be a plurality. Therefore, anything that is not a plurality has no size, and everything that is a plurality is made up of things that have no size. So there is no size to any plurality. The opposite is argued as follows. An object that is not a plurality, but still takes up space, can be cut in half. A front part and a back part and then that half can also be cut in half again, a front part and a back part. And thus, there can be an infinite number of divisions made in space without ever getting to zero space. Hence, everything is made up of an infinite amount of spatially distinct halves. And thus, any one thing is infinitely large. Most philosophers who discuss Zeno's paradoxes tried to explain these paradoxes and show how Zeno and where Zeno made a mistake in his reasoning. In other words, they tried to solve his paradoxes. However, I'm not going to do that. I want you to think about them yourself. What is the nature of distance, time, motion, space, plurality, etc. And when you start doing that, you will see that not only is pondering the question much more fun than me simply giving you the answer, but also that modern science might not have come this far if the imagination of mathematicians, physicists and logicians had not been so profoundly triggered by Zeno and his paradoxes. Next up in this series, the philosopher who thought Parmenides had it 100% backward, and the second player in the greatest debate of all time, Heraclitus. Heraclitus.